Well, buckle up for a hawkish Jerome Powell this week. Yeah, in case you haven't heard, Jerome Powell is testifying before Congress Wednesday and Thursday. And since he basically says the same thing on Thursday as he does on Wednesday, buckle up for Wednesday. In this video, I'm going to give you a preview for what to expect for Jerome Powell. Hint, it's not great. We're going to go through four significant risks that I see. And remember, Congress is going to beat up on Jerome Powell. That is their job. They basically beat up on anybody who testifies before Congress. That's the point. They have to make themselves look good, especially in an election year, to make it seem like they're doing everything in their power to make sure people are doing their freaking jobs. When the reality is Congress basically can't get their job done almost ever. But then again, maybe that's the point of Congress to do basically nothing. Anyway, let's just focus on the Fed so we don't get political here. Jerome Powell speaks 7 a.m. Pacific time Wednesday morning in Congress. Again, he'll speak again on Thursday morning, but Wednesday will matter. The first significant risk that we're going to face beyond Congress's bullying, which quick tangent, Congress is going to bully Jerome Powell on two things. Banking crisis number one. They're always looking in the rearview mirror, okay? They're gonna focus on the banking crisis, risks that we're gonna have more banking regulation, and they're basically paid by the banks to be, hey, um, maybe y'all don't have to regulate as much. Maybe, maybe y'all have done enough and y'all can, can back off the regulation a little bit. See, Jamie Dimon, thanks for your bag of cash. I'm going to bat for you, even though I know he ain't gonna change his mind. Jerome Paul's gonna be, yeah, well, we'll release some, uh, We'll release some new guidelines uh, in the coming months. And they're going to be more banking regulations, which are a risk to smaller banks, commercial real estate. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. That, that's going to be one aspect. Another prong you're going to get from Congress is going to be, man, why are prices still so much higher than they were in 2019? And Jay Powell's going to be like, well, we printed too much damn money. Very simple, okay? Those aren't really the risks. Like, we already know... That banter is going to happen. There's going to be complaining about prices. And then there's going to be, please don't have more financial condition uh, tightness on or, or, or uh, financial restrictions on banks and regulatory restrictions on banks. Because if you do, I'm going to get paid less from the banks. It's, it's a simple game. It's a simple world. It's all driven by money. Let's just make that very clear. Money equals incentives. Okay, but those aren't the risks. The real risks are actually very simple. Number one, financial conditions. Loose financial conditions almost always leave a, well, hawkish Jerome Powell. And let's just say if you go to ehack.com, you could see the latest Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. And um, if, you, if you can look past the fact that we're basically at the same level as we were here in, uh, at the end of December, financial conditions are basically the lowest that they have been in the entire last year. In fact, they are substantially low. Now, one of the things that drives financial conditions low are interest rates, and another thing it would be stocks. Well, the 10 year is sitting at 4.21, which is a little lower, but the stock market is breaking all time new highs over and over and over again. As a result, even though that Nike swoosh is playing out and the good old cues and the indices and driven by the hotness and the heat, fervor and cash flow of AI, which the cash flow in AI is real. There are a lot of us that are like, that's a bubble, but the cash flow is real at companies like NVIDIA. How long the growth will last is questionable, but it's real cash flow. And in this kind of market, the companies with the gold make the rules. That's the golden rule after all. The one with the bag of gold makes all the rules. Anyway, this is going to likely lead to a more hawkish j Pow this week. Why does he need to be dovish when financial conditions are being dovish for him? In fact, he's more likely to reiterate, if not even outright confirm, that March rate cuts are way off the table. Not only are March rate cuts way off the table, but May might be off the table as well. Given that March is only priced in at about a 4% chance that we're going to get a cut, not too worried about that. I'm more worried about what the pain is going to be of shifting rate cuts from maybe June to July. 
Right now, we've got a 24% chance of rate cuts in May. We've got about a 70% chance of rate cuts in June. If that gets punted to July because of weak financial conditions and a still strong economy, well, the market's going to have to somehow figure out how to price that delay in, and it has not been priced in yet. And so, obviously, you've got to start evaluating, okay, what sectors are potentially more likely to be at risk here. The second aspect that we're going to have to pay attention to, and I did break this down on ehack.com as well, like I always do, but the second place we have to pay attention is the jobs recession not panning out. Yes, job losses are occurring. People are getting laid off. This is true. But a lot of these face structural issues, such as high interest rates or companies like Xerox, who just announced layoffs, when the reality is people are just printing us. Come on, it's Xerox. So yes, you're going to see layoffs in some of the legacy sectors that are holding on to more employees than they really should be holding on to. But when we actually look at the data, we have to be real here. Tech layoffs, for example, are down to just 39% in February of 2024 compared to what they were in February of 2023. And war notices, well, those are trending down, not up. For us to really have a labor recession, these lines should be crystal clearly moving up. And here they're either moving sideways or down. Third, even though issues like New York Community Bank are swelling due to office and commercial real estate facing large issues, small banks, let's be real here, face significantly more commercial real estate risk than highly important banks. Yes, of course, we did have a banking crisis last year. But the banking crisis last year was driven by a cryptocurrency collapse in Terra Luna and valuation collapse across the board for crypto, which of course has you know rebounded substantially now. VC reductions, think about this, there are about 50% or are today, there are about 50% fewer venture capitalists today than there were in 2021, which that ended up helping wax Silicon Valley Bank, whereas the crypto crisis ended up whacking Signature Bank. Those two wax. Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, those ended up leading to bank runs at local and community banks, which led to the collapse of First Republic, which JP Morgan swooped in, got deposit guarantees and backstops from the federal government and JPOW, and boom, JP Morgan Chase gets a delicious wedge deal. <laughs> like, super jealous of JP Morgan, but honestly, good on them. <laughs> it's just, it's kind of crazy. The big just get bigger. But the point is, yes, we did have a banking crisis in 2023, but it wasn't driven by commercial or office real estate. It was actually driven by a bank run, thanks to issues in the venture capital world and cryptocurrency. Now, what happened? Well, the government has basically backstopped all deposits. Remember the FDIC bailout? We're not going to take any haircuts. They basically said, no, we will not allow bank runs in America anymore. Permanent bailout via this FDIC uh, convincing argument that even if you have more than deposit insurance, deposit the bank, we won't let you lose money. As a result, what's happening? Well, you've got a banking crisis going on at New York Community Bank. That freaking stock has gone to trash as it should because it's got now material weaknesses uh, in its accounting practices. In other words, its losses are probably substantially larger than they actually appear to be. It's kind of like uh, you have a little sticker on the bank. Losses are larger than they appear on our balance sheet. <laughs> uh, it's bad. But guess what's not happening at New York Community Bank? Deposit outflows. So you don't actually really have a systemic banking issue because people aren't conducting a run on the banks. Maybe that's why Jerome Powell in January removed the line, the banking system is sound and resilient from his presser, not because he actually thinks the banking crisis is getting worse, but because he's just not concerned about it anymore. His bailout worked. Now, of course, it could also be sinister and everything's about to collapse, but I don't know that Jerome Powell, even if that's true, is going to let on to that at this congressional hearing. Instead, I think we're gonna get hawkishness due to financial conditions. We're going to get hawkishness due to the jobs recession not really panning out, uh, in other, which, which is a good thing. I mean, we don't want people to go jobless. It's just, it just means the economy's probably going to be doing stronger than we expected. There's really no risk of a bank run because of the universal bailout backed by taxpayers. Yes, FDIC losses are backed by taxpayers. Uh, and fourth, this is the next one to consider. Even Jerome Powell 
expected real estate prices in the single family world, which really affect consumer prices and rents, he expected prices in real estate to fall. Remember, he told first time home buyers that he would wait for more balance in the market, mostly because he expected home prices to fall. And what ended up happening? Well, thanks to the 30 year lock in, creating substantially low inventory in singles, what are we left with? No real price shift in singles. Yes, we've had volatility. You know, the, the end of uh, 2022 and October, November of 2023 saw prices down maybe 8 to 10% from peak. So yes, there was a flux down, but we continuously just recover from that right away, at least in singles. Maybe that'll change going forward. But the point of this video is what do we expect for this week in JPOW? And the reality is not good. Consider for a moment what we've got with GDP. And this is probably the only thing that actually maybe supports a little bit of a dovish Powell. Why did GDP just plummet from basically an estimate of 3% to 2.1%, which is still above, you know, longer term growth trajectories of 2%. You're still above it, even with this drop over here. Well, it likely happened because we got construction data on Friday. We got a negative 0.2% print versus a positive 2.2% print expected. Uh, and, and so that really seemed to manipulate the seasonally adjusted annual GDP rate down. But this is also a very volatile graph. I mean, look, just in January, we're above 4%. Yes, we're half that now, but what's the average? Probably 3%. So let's be real. I would love to scream that Powell is likely to be dovish this week, but I, I, I just don't think that would be the honest argument here. I think there is a greater risk that Jerome Powell is going to be a dirty, dirty hawk this week. And I encourage you to A, buckle up, and B, join me in the courses linked down below and the live streams we do every day with fundamental analysis and trade ideas. Check them out by going to meetkevin.com. Make sure to check out the event we've got coming up on June 21st to 23rd. As speaker announcements come out, the price will be going up. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.